Good morning, my name is Daniela Kraus. Good morning, the audience here in the, Pre the Press Club Concordia in Vienna. Welcome to the audience online. And welcome to our speaker, Sergei Medvedev. Hello. Uh, we will learn from you, if it's possible to learn from history. Um, can Russia's history explain the context for understanding the invasion of Ukraine? Um, Sergei will give a talk on the topic. Uh, Mirjana Tomic, hello, good morning, welcome, will introduce Sergei in a minute. Um, my part is only to say thank you, thank you to you, Sergei, thank you to Mirjana, uh, and also thank you to our partners. This is a cooperation event in a series of uh, talks about uh, context uh, on political uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, it's, a, it's a partnership between the Press Club, between Film Forum for Journalism and Vienna, and between the IWM, Institute for the Institute for the Wissenschaften von Menschen uh, World in Pieces program, which is led by Ivan Krastev and by Klemena Antonova. Klemena, you want to say something, or shall I hand over to Miriana? Just to say, thank you very much for the for the cooperation. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Say, uh, thank you very much for for coming. As uh, Daniela said, this is an event which is co-organized with the Institute for Human Sciences, and the speaker, Professor Sergei Medvedev is uh, a fellow with the World in Pieces program. This is a new program which we started at the Institute uh, uh, this year. The title, as you see, reflects the spirit of the times. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you. And the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning. And thank you for uh, coming to everyone who is in the room and to, of course, everyone on Zoom, where we have people really from all over Europe. Uh, thank you, Sergei, for joining us for the second time uh, for this talk that is very timely, not necessarily optimistic. The topic, Can Russia's History Explain the Context for Understanding the Invasion of Ukraine? Or Does the Current War Represent a New Phenomenon? About four or five years ago, or maybe even seven, I listened to a German expert here in Vienna, I don't recall his name, said, that the entire departments of Russia's studies in Germany were dismantled after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was assumed that Kremlinologists were no longer needed because Moscow would join Europe. After Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine, the number of Russia experts have proliferated exponentially. Everyone has an opinion. Well, I have invited Sergei to give us an informed and educated uh, opinion. Just a few words about Sergei. Sergei is a historian, political scientist, and a journalist, currently an affiliate professor at Charles University in Prague and a professor at the Free University in Riga. He has held research positions and professorships in Russia, Germany, Italy, and Finland. In Moscow, he taught at the High School of Economics. In March uh, 2022, he left Russia. Uh, this May, right now, he's the fellow of the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, his most recent book, uh, The Return of the Russian Leviathan, uh, has won the 2020 Pushkin uh, House Book Prize the, as the best English language nonfiction book on Russia, and has been translated into 12 languages. His new book, that will come up in several months, uh, it's called A War Made in Russia. I have to admit, I have seen the manuscript, so some questions will come from uh, the book. Before you start your presentation or a talk, Sergei, I have an opening question. You were our guest speaker at the end of June 2021, together with uh, three other experts on the use and abuse of history for ideological purposes. At the time, you said, it's only two years ago, you said that the rhetoric, when it comes to the memory, had changed dramatically from never again in reference to World War II to we can do it again. I asked you then, does this mean war? And you said, rhetorically, yes, but not a real war. Two years later, in your book, you're right. War has always been a way of life for the Russian state. It's very raison d'être. The word is yours. 
Uh, thank you, uh, and it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be speaking here in what I learned is the oldest press club in the world, uh, because also it calls to my second identity, as um, uh, you said, I'm not only a uh, professor at the various universities, but I'm also a sort of a media personality. I've been for 15 years already working in the media and making my uh, TV and radio programs. So being in the press club is also sort of a uh, calling back to my second identity. Uh, and yes, thank you, Emiliano, for this question. It's very appropriate because uh, me, myself, and uh, many other analysts and uh, Russia specialists uh, would really admit to not having expected this war to come as a full frontal classical 19th, 15th, uh, whatever, 10th century war uh, that happened in the middle of Europe, uh, well, in the, in the east of Europe in uh, 2023. So uh, in 2021, I wouldn't have imagined it. I wouldn't have imagined it even on the eve of the invasion, in the last week before the invasion, in February 2022, uh, I was still thinking that it was a big bluff. And many people, and actually uh, those of you following Russia may remember the famous seating of the Security Council two days before the invasion, when Putin announced that Russia is going to accept the Donetsk and Lugansk oblast into Russia, and his closest associates were taken by shock, were taken by surprise. They could barely speak, uh, having learned that he decided to start this war. So I think this is really a big uh, event which we have yet to realize, which we have yet to understand. And actually my main message here and actually, also, it's important in understanding why we have so much miscalculated, why we have misjudged Putin and we didn't expect this war to come about, is to understand the objective nature of this war. This is what my new book is about, The War Made in Russia, that this war is really objective. It's profoundly inscribed in the logic of Russian history, of Russian modernity, of Putin's state. It's a a uh, logical reification of the political system built by Putin, but also built by Russian history. So actually, I asked to be uh, uh, to have the uh, this board here. So I will just draw some things on the board to once again to stress the historical logic behind this war, what they came about. So in the beginning, in the center, we will have this total phenomenon, this war which is really the biggest shock in uh, post-Soviet history, obviously, but I would say one of the biggest shock in the entire length of Russian history. That's really a decisive moment, one of the, you know, axis events of the Russian history. And the war, uh, of course, it's also, uh, we cannot talk about war without talking about Putin. And the main question I think we have to answer, is this Putin's war or is this Russia's war? Would there be war if there were no Putin? It's a really very philosophical question. Would there be war if there was no Hitler? It's, we still have to think about this question. So uh, I think it's about the objective and the subjective here. And actually my answer is that uh, there could have been a war even without Putin, but Putin has a big share of responsibility. So when I talk about um, the objectivity of this war, I would use the metaphor, I think it would be quite understandable here in Austria, which is a mountain country, um, Lavina of the avalanche. When the avalanche comes down, is it objective or is it subjective? The snow is falling down in the mountains, you know, for weeks. And there is a big, it's hanging over on a cliff, it's hanging over the valley. So there's a big hangover, a big mass of snow. So in this sense, the avalanche is objective. But then it takes one single event to one single person, let's say a stupid skier that goes skiing on top of the avalanche and cuts it. And then this big mass of snow travels down the hill and then, you know, buries the village beneath and goes down in the valley. So can we say that the avalanche was inevitable? No, not really. Weather conditions could have been different, there could have been a big thaw or like a big freeze. And um, so it's not necessarily that avalanche will be set off every year in the same place. But then it is there. 
It is a force of nature. It has been building up. And it takes a subjective action of just one person to start off this avalanche. And we're now in the middle of this avalanche, just going down with it, trying to stay on top of this mass of snow. So this is about the role of Putin. But as to the objective nature, I think the war uh, is um, bringing to a finished form the Putin state and the Russian state. It's sort of a, a classical finished form of the Russian state as it has developed over the past decades and indeed over the past centuries. So it finishes off this war several periods in Russian history. One is the period of Putinism. So this is, uh, you know, from his coming to power, 1999 to 2023. So we don't know yet how long it will last, but anyway, so this is Putin's period. So this is, uh, he has brought uh, Russia, uh, he has reified Russia. Russia has taken his, Putin's state has taken his final form in this, its final form in this war. But it's much more than this. It also finishes off uh, the post-Soviet period, which started in 1991. It's uh, the end of the post-Soviet transition. We can no longer talk about post-Soviet. We cannot talk about post-Soviet space. We can no longer talk about post-Soviet Russia. The post-Soviet period had ended. The period of transition had ended. Russia has made a full circle. Russia is now back at square one of its classical imperial identity. So, the post-Soviet period. But this is also the end uh, of the Soviet period, of the period of 1917 to 1991, because this is uh, the sort of Russia is reliving uh, its Soviet past, recreating its Soviet empire. And this brings us back to the question of the Russian empire. And this, uh, too, uh, for me, uh, the end of the Russian imperial period. Uh, and the Russian imperial period, actually, it's a very interesting question. When it all started, officially, Russia has become an empire in 1721, at the end of the Northern War between Russia and Sweden, after which Peter the Great claimed that he is a Caesar, Kesar, Kaiser. He, he is the emperor. So Russia started to be in an empire. But in fact, I would contend that Russia started being an empire after the uh, takeover of Ukraine in the middle of the 17th century, in 1654. Because this is, was this big geopolitical entry into Russia. Russia became the dominant force in this northern Eurasian space. So actually, and actually uh, this is uh, why Zbigniew Brzezinski was always saying that Ukraine is a pivot to Russian empire. Russia can no longer be an empire without Ukraine. And therefore, we have such ferocity, we have such resentment in Russia these days in fighting over Ukraine. Because losing Ukraine, Russia ceases to be empire. It's its last chance to be called an imperial power with Ukraine. So the loss of Ukraine is absolutely pivotal and crucial for Russia's identity, uh, for Russia's imperial identity. So let's say it's, 1654 to 1917. But I would contend that this war ends off an even longer cycle of Russian history, an even longer period of Russian history. And this is the Moscow period of Russian history. Because this all really started, this whole big story starts in 1552, in uh, the reign of Ivan the Terrible, when he takes Kazan, the, uh, the capital of the Tartar Khanat, one of the last remains of the Golden Horde of the Empire of Genghis Khan, and Russia crosses the River Volga. So this is really a key point in the, piece, in the rise of Muscovy. Actually, we may even go to the grandfather of Ivan the Terrible, Ivan III, the end of the 15th century. That is when the Moscow Kremlin was constructed, the white wall of the Moscow Kremlin built by the Italian architects. So I would say that, um, we have to go to mm, like late 1400s, 1480s, to let's say 17th century, the Moscow period. Moscow, the empire. 
the USSR. So you see, in 2023, we have these five periods of Russian history coming to a culmination. The Putin period of Russian history, the post-Soviet period of Russian history, the Soviet period of Russian history, the imperial period of Russian history, and the Moscow period of Russian history. So this is like a triumph, the final form of Muscovy, the Muscovite state as a hare to the Golden Horde, as a big Eurasian force. You know, the Moscow Tsars were calling themselves Huns. Ivan the Great was citing his letter as the Moscow Han Ivan. So the Moscow princes, later the Moscow Tsars, are the real hares to the Golden Horde. So the emergence of this big Eurasian space, the emergence of this big Eurasian empire, dates back to the end of the 15th century. And this all now culminates in this war. Uh, make no mistake about the nature of this war. It is not just a war of Russian imperial legacy. It is not just a war of Russia's resentment, a post-colonial war, a geopolitical uh, grab of territory, as many in the world would see Russia. For Russia, this is really a world war. It's really very difficult to understand it now. In May 2023, in the sunny Vienna, and uh, you know we are living in more or less peaceful Europe, and there's a conflict several thousand miles away from here. And uh, yet, we have to understand that this is World War III in the head of Putin. And he has been preparing for it for at least 15 years. I see the first traits of this war, the first signs of this war, in his Munich speech in February 2007 at the Munich Security Conference when he announced the perennial strife with the West, when he said that Russia has its own sphere of interest, and this includes the entire post-Soviet space, and Russia has been betrayed by the West in the form of NATO enlargement. This is one of big Putin's ideas, ideologies, uh, the idea of betrayal by the West very much like Hitler had this idea of betrayal uh, in, this, in the center of his identity. And um, so Russia has been preparing for this war for at least 15 years. Uh, and uh, this is not really a war over Ukraine. Ukraine is just a pretext. Ukraine is just a testing ground for a big confrontation of Russia with the West. It's about the new world order. Russia feels that it belongs among the makers and the biggest forces in the modern world. And it has been unjustly expelled from the world order after 1991, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. So Russia, uh, in Putin's ideas, and that's actually part of the identity which he's constructed in the nation, which he sold to the nation, um, is should be one of the major players in the world, along with probably China, well, definitely China, uh, Europe, and the United States, should be one of the makers of the modern world. And Putin wants to change the rules of the game, to bring Russia back on the world stage as the key player. Now, he plays a weak hand. He understands that Russia does not have an economic power, a you know, soft power, the attractiveness of the you know, its, uh, you know, social economic model, anything. It doesn't have the manpower, it doesn't have, as we now see, it does not have the military power to do it. Yet, Russia has another power, the power of fear, the power of chaos, and the power of destruction. So Russia does not have the ability to construct the world, but it has yet the ability to destruct the world, to ruin the world, to spoil, to send its agents of chaos, to blow up the pipelines, to seed uh, chemical weapons all over the place, to disrupt communications, to start small wars, proxy wars in its vicinity, which you know ruin the world economy, ruin the world energy market, grain market, uh, you know, send off uh, the economies to inflation, and so on. So Russia still has this significant capacity to seed chaos. And Putin's close aides openly say about this. Russia as a generator of entropy in the world. Vladislav Surkov, you know, one of these ideologists of Putinism, published an article on the eve of Russian invasion uh, saying that uh, uh, Russia is a place, which is very much true, full of entropy, 
right? Russian space is very entropic, and Russia should use it, should capitalize it. We should be exporting entropy. We should be generating entropy as our trump card in the world. So the war in Ukraine is precisely about this. It's not just about the imperial resentment. It's about disrupting the modern world, making it as painful for the world as possible in order to overstay the West. You know, Putin's really believe that he has the staying power, which the West has not. He can oversit the Western leaders, which are accountable to its populations, to its electorates, which can be effectively eventually tired of this war. So the supplies of weapons to Ukraine cease, the support of Ukraine ceases, and then maybe Trump comes to power in 2024, and Putin will still be there. So he thinks he has the biggest reserve, which is called time. And he still hopes that he can remake the world order. And indeed, the world order will be remade if Putin prevails in Ukraine. This will be a clear signal to the rest of the world. This will be a signal to China with respect to Taiwan. This will be a signal to other revanchist power across the world. So this is my message here that this is not just the war of, over Ukraine, but it is indeed in Putin's mind, in the minds of the Russian elite, a World War III. And um, the problem is, is that the world is not yet aware of this. It's really very similar to a situation uh, in the um, 1930s, when the world up to the very last minute did not believe Hitler's plan to remake the world order, to become dominant not just in Europe, but in the whole world. So this policy of uh, appeasement, the policy of seeking dialogue with the dictator, with the disruptor, is it looks like Europe has not really learned the hard lessons of the 1930s and the 1940s. So, so okay, I may I interrupt you and ask again. you a few things following mm -hmm. what you have just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing is, what does Russian population get out of it? Uh, what, did they, uh, what did they get out of this uh, new order on the individual level? And also, when you say uh, appeasement uh, is not the solution, what would the defeat look like if that is the that's, solution? Now, that would be my, you know, the end of my presentation. So this is like what, 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 it all, uh, what it all is. First on the population, well, first the per Russian population is not a player in this game. I mean, Russia is a dictatorship. Russia is an autocracy. Who cares about what Russian population gets from it? Who cares about the opinions of the Russian population? Basically, they are eating whatever the state feeds them. In this case, well, they will get pride. They will, of course, not get better roads, better, you know, internet speed, uh, better medical care, better salaries. They would say yes, as they were saying this for hundreds of years. We are suffering. We don't have a toilet in the house. We have like an outhouse somewhere in the vegetable garden, but we're a great power. The world is afraid of us. So that's uh, what they get. They're getting a false sense of national pride and uh, superiority of being a superpower, of being feared all over the world. Fear is the biggest Russian asset and the biggest sense of you know, pride, the big Russian bear. Ah, look, all the world is afraid of the bear. So that's, that's what the population is getting. And they're even uh, willing to trade off you know, the lives of their husbands and children for this uh, you know, global fear that Russia is exporting. Uh, as for the future, as we are getting out of it. So my message here, once again, the first of the first part I was saying, is that this war is really systemic, historical, and logical. It's built in the logic of Russian history. It uh, culminates the Russian um, tradition of the big state, of authoritarian government, of the state-organized society. The society is not independent in Russia. It's ruled and organized by the state. And Putin has recreated this all. Now, in order to end this war, uh, well, the war is really uh, like thinking about the future of Russia is very difficult now. It's like we're, imagine we're in 1943 or 1944, or, no, even earlier, 1942. And you ask me in 1942, what is the future of Germany? <laughs> I don't know. Germany has yet to be defeated if we talk in 1942. So I don't know what is the future in Russia in 2023. Russia has yet to be defeated. And without the defeat, it's uh, a very disastrous future for Russia, for Ukraine, for the world. 
So in order to think, to productively think about the future, we have to remove the system. We have to remove war, we have to remove Putin, and yet it will be still not incomplete, not enough. I would even say that a defeat of Russia is not enough to change the future. And a death, a departure, a hog tribunal for Putin also is not enough for this. Right, you know, we, we had Milosevic in the hog. Did Serbia change that much in its revanchist thinking? Uh, so um, that's, you know, we, we had the removal of uh, Saddam. Did Iraq change that much? And actually Saddam stayed in power uh, for 15 years after the defeat in Kuwait and he still ruled over. So likewise, Putin can stay in Russia, you know, for years and decades indeed, even if Russia suffers a defeat in Ukraine. So those who are saying that, ah, oh, Putin will be ousted by his generals the minute that Russia loses the war. I don't think so. This will be a resentful and insulted and revanchist Russia there, and which will be an even bigger threat to the world than it is today, still possessing a nuclear potential. So uh, in order um, to get out of this war, I see the three outcomes. Let me just consult with my notes here uh, to be exact. So one is the, and I think what Putin is hopes for is the continuation of the current trend. And the continuation, the sad thing, the continuation of the system of the Russian system. The point is, it can happen even without Putin and without the war. If there is an incomplete defeat of Russia, Russia just retracts, Russia preserves its military potential, Russia returns, preserves its nuclear potential, its seat in the UN Security Council, by the way, of which Russia is now chairman. Uh, so, uh, it's like once again, I always have these parallels with Germany in World War II. Let's say that, no, the world said in 1944, okay, let's leave Germany as it is. Let Germany return to the borders of the Reich and leave Hitler and leave NSDAP and leave, you know, some part of the German army and they just, you know, retract from probably, you know, liberate Austria and Bohemia and, uh, you know, the other nations. Uh, and let's leave Germany as it is. Would it be a better world? What world it, would it be in the 1940s and the 1950s if Hitler stayed? if Germany was stayed in the borders of the German Empire, of, uh, you know, the borders of like 1933. So that's the thing. And we are actually, I think, moving towards this scenario because I don't see the world ready to take similar action against Putin as it took against Hitler in 1945. So we are looking at a resentful Russia, at a Russia which, is just nurturing its sense of grief, its sense of defeat, saying, you know, we had the heroic uh, uh, warriors that were standing up, uh, well, like we lost 100, 200, 500,000 people that stood up to the challenge of NATO, the combined force of, you know, Rammstein, all the Western military technology going against us, but we stood up and, you know, we sort of, we preserved the territorial integrity of the nation, but we'll be back with a vengeance. So I think we're unfortunately moving, that's the most probable scenario for me. The second scenario of all this is the breakup. And I think this is, has a lot of a wishful thinking in it because many people these days are thinking, ah, oh, you know, the situation is so rotten, it went so far that it will all end up in the breakup of Russia. It's so comforting thinking about this, that, you know, it's suddenly a bright future. There are all these independent, uh, you know, resigning independent Far East, and then Kaliningrad goes off to the European Union, and then there's the Caucasus, and then the, you know, the Volga, uh, the Volga regions becoming Islamic states, and uh, ah, it's so beautiful, uh, the, new, the new big map of Eurasia. But, you know, the, the fact is, um, it's a nice uh, subject for fiction, like Vladimir Sorokin, for instance, writes a lot about this, and he's a great political prophet, by the way, the writer. Uh, but um, I don't see any political subjectivity behind this, like it was in the breakup of the Soviet Union. You know what's the difference with the breakup of the Soviet Union? They were already elites, proto-nations and identities, ready to take up power. There was a Lithuanian elite, a Latvian elite, there was a history of independence, right? They were the quasi-states, that were ready to become full states. 
in the case of the Russian Empire, uh, of the Russia of today, I don't see. Well, probably Tatarstan has a bigger sense of independence and identity. Probably some ethnic republics, well, Bashkortostan, close to Tatarstan. But otherwise, uh, you know, the regions have been so much subjugated by Putin, by the Kremlin, that I don't see them taking up independence and you know, basically, also, I don't see any other world powers, you know, in the 21st century willing to occupy parts of Russia, China moving in the Far East, you know, European Union moving in Kaliningrad, and then what, Finland moving in Karelia. I don't think this is happening. So nobody needs this big frozen barren space except Russia itself. That's a sad thing. Russia spent the past 500 years exploring, discovering, exploring, and conquering this big frozen space, which is as usable as the territory of the moon. And I don't think the world really needs to just come over and occupy and uh, that uh, you know, there will be other nations emerging in this space. So unfortunately, I don't see the scenario of breakup as a, a feasible one. And the third scenario, which is the most, uh, like, um, the most positive here, and I'm ending this, uh, I know we're in the time mark, is the uh, reconstitution of Russia. And this is a completely imaginary scenario. But uh, let me say that, uh, just take this, you know, this caveat, that I'm talking about the desired outcome, not the possible outcome. So what is desired, what is needed in order for Russia to remain in the 21st century and for the world to remain in the 21st century and for the world and Europe to be peaceful is a program of, you know, Germany in 1945, did it have like five Ds? like denazification, demilitarization, democratization, remember there was a program? Russia needs more than this. So it has a program of, I don't know, let's count. Here, just write it in different color. Deputinization. Putin has to be removed better if he goes with his closest associates to the, to the Hague. There's a like trial, a big tribunal, like the Nuremberg Tribunal, Russia paying reparations to Ukraine. Uh, and um, the ideology of Putinism and Russian imperialism uh, and Russian, uh, whatever, fascism. It's a different topic. We didn't have time to talk about this today, but you know, I'm ready to take with the question. It has to be condemned. So deputinization has to be accompanied by the process of denazification of Russia. Russia is talking about denazifying Ukraine, but in fact, no, Russia itself displays all uh, traits of the fascist and indeed Nazi behavior, treating Ukraine as non-nation. Once again, no time to talk about this. Then, of course, demilitarization of Russia. and attendant to this denuclearization. Let's face it, in order to move to the future world, Russia has to be deprived of its nuclear capacity. What stands between us and the future is the Russian nuclear weapon. It's as simple as that. So this problem has to be decided. And Russia has shown it doesn't stick to the international treaties on uh, nuclear weapons, the Budapest Memorandum, which was blatantly violated in Russia's occupation of Ukraine, when Russia was, you know, guarantor of Ukraine territorial integrity in exchange for Ukraine giving up the nuclear weapon. Who, who would once again believe Russia in this thing? So um, once again, the Russian nuclear potential issue has to be solved, otherwise there's no future. And then uh, finally there's another four Ds, so there should be a D imperialization of Russia. Russia has T's being an empire. If we look back, all this old history uh, should stop this imperial thinking. Decolonization of the Russian space. Uh, Russia is an internal a state which has colonized its own territory. 
So Russia's own territories have to be given more independence and more leeway to become proper political subjects. The Russian land, Russian country should be given a voice against the Russian state. So de-imperialization, decolonization, uh, de actually de-Moscovization. I think that if we think of a future Russia, this has to be a post-Moscow Russia. The capital has to be removed from Moscow. Moscow, I think, is really one of the roots of evil. It's a capital, um, you know, Russia already enjoyed the European period of its history when capital was moved out of Moscow. It was the St. Petersburg period of history of 200 years between the early uh, <coughs> 18th to the early 20th century. Moscow is the Eurasian capital. It's not the European capital. It's the capital of northern Eurasia. So uh, there has to be demoscovization. And just think about it, Russia is the only modern nation, major modern nation with a big industrial military capacity and member of the UN Security Council that is governed from inside the medieval castle. You know, the power is done from the Kremlin. They're sitting in the 15th century castle. They're looking at the world behind, from behind the Kremlin walls, these dented walls built for defense. So the power has to be taken out of the Kremlin and moved elsewhere in Russia, I don't know, somewhere across the country, maybe more to the middle of Russia. Kazan could be a likely capital, Yekaterinburg could be a likely capital, or there could be a new capital built somewhere, you know, outside Moscow with more transparent architecture, like, you know, the new German, the architecture of German statehood is much more transparent. Looking at the Bundeskanzleramt or at the, you know, the glass cupola with which Norman Foster had covered the Reichstag, the Bundestag, the building of the Reichstag. So it has to be moved. It's like it's, a, it's as if, like these days, as if China is ruled from the Forbidden City. China is not ruled from the Forbidden City. <laughs> Russia should not be ruled from the Kremlin. So demoscovization uh, should be a big part of this. And then, of course, democratization of Russia, but I don't put it in the first place. So I know this is all wishful thinking. These are all like remote capacities, or remote possibilities. And uh, the first thing which has to be done is that for the world, for the West, for NATO, for the European Union, uh, also for a country like Austria, to understand once again that this is World War III, that this is not a, uh, a regional conflict in the fringes of Europe, that what is at stake is the future of Europe and the future of the world, not just the future of Russia. And it requires the same political consolidation, the same resolve as the world showed in 1945 in fighting the Nazi Germany. The challenge is comparable. And indeed, and that's the last thing which I will end um, uh, here, since we're here in the 10th of May, and these days that the world remembers the end of uh, the World War II, the Rimas 1945, is, and that's actually how I end, um, you read the book, that's you know, the last the ending of the book which is coming out. We have to finish off the job of 1945, because 1945 is an unfinished work. There were two totalitarian dictatorships, let's say two fascist dictatorships facing the free world, and only one was defeated. And the other dictatorship temporarily allied with the West, survived, carried on, and now resurrected in its traditional imperialist guise. So the world has to finish off the job of 1945 and defeat the second dictatorship. And only then can we be confident about the future. Thank you. On this positive note, <laughs> on this positive note, uh, well, first of all, uh, I open, uh, uh, you know, for questions in the room, but also, uh, Klemena, could you please help me? Uh, we shall have two questions in the room, two questions from the chat, uh, and I will ask our, I'm sorry? There are no questions in the chat? Okay, sure. So uh, then we shall start with the room, but people on Zoom can also ask questions. Uh, okay, uh, first Jordi, <laughs> then you, then you please uh, introduce yourself, then for number four. Jordi, go ahead, introduce yourself. Oh yes, uh, Gunther, we do need the microphone. Hello. 
Hello, my name is Jordi Cus. I'm from the Spanish News Agency. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I have a short question about the World War III uh, issue. If Russia had succeeded like they thought they would in three or four days, would we be still World War III or would have it stopped then or would have been even worse? Are we better off fighting against them for Yeah, Yeah, uh, no, 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 Russia would not have stopped. It would be an encouragement for Putin. They would have moved on. I think Moldova would be next on the list. And um, actually, I think the Russian contingents uh, and sleeping agents in the Baltic states would have risen their head. And then Putin has an absolutely, um, absolutely paranoid uh, about Poland, although it's really hard to imagine that a NATO member could be attacked, but there would be a big destabilization program. No, this would be an encouragement. It's like we were asking in 2014, okay, Russia took Crimea, will they stop at this? Let's let, let's, let's Putin get, let, let him get away with Crimea and he will be happy. No, he's not happy. He will not be happy until he takes off the entire Ukraine and then, you know what, North Kazakhstan? There were already, uh, you know, big uh, encroachments on North Kazakhstan. So he says that, uh, you know, no post-Soviet state should get away to, with what Russia given, you know, it, as gifts. So he sees their independence as gifts from Russia. And he doesn't treat them seriously. He doesn't treat them as full states. So no, this would be an encouragement and that would be an invitation to a much worse scenario. Please introduce and then you, no, here. No, no, here, here, uh, uh, Gunther, Thank you. here, and then, um, uh, Jörg uh, Rauchenberg, uh, Institute of the Danube Region in Central Europe, uh, IDM Info. Um, I have a question about uh, China. How do you see China and the possible three scenarios? Uh, on the one hand, uh, they would certainly not like that there is chaos in Europe or atomic weapons are used. On the other hand, would they just look and, and watch <laughs> if Russia is falling down? Okay, thank you. Well, China uh, is a very, uh, sort of, say, interested onlooker and uh, benefactor of all these developments. So far, I think China is the biggest winner of all these developments uh, of 2022-2023. Uh, so they're getting cheap Russian oil and gas. Uh, they are replacing whatever Western technology is there, uh, although they are trying to stick with the sanctions, but still, you know, the Chinese car export has uh, boomed uh, in, in, into Russia and, and so on. I don't really think that they are up to territorial grabs as I said. They, they would really see Russia as their resource colony and as a faithful ally in, you know, playing the big geopolitical games with the United States. As like the biggest story still, uh, I would say at least from the American point of view, would be the uh, opposition between the US and China. And China needs Russia as a faithful ally on this, uh, in this global standoff. So yes, I would uh, say Russia, China would go uh, along its imperial ways, and um, but uh, without uh, these things uh, such as, uh, and of course, it definitely do not need uh, the breakup of Russia and the chaos in Russia. So it is interested in uh, whatever controllability there is uh, in um, in Russia. No, no, China has Taiwan on its mind and other issues. It just needs a loyal, uh, faithful, and controllable Russia. Thank you. You, and then uh, two questions uh, online. Please, go, Orika. Uh, Gunther, here, please. And then uh, we shall go for online questions. Go ahead. Uh, Bernard Oichner, Tagesanzeige Switzerland. Uh, you were talking about finishing the job from 1945, but when I look at the billboard uh, at your red demands, it reminds me actually more than what the Allies did in 1918 to Germany, which actually we know... <laughs> led to World War III. So wouldn't that leave actually a deeply offended nation that is looking for revenge? Uh, well, the point is the way that Russia is reconstituted. You know, while the Allies did a proper job in 1945 with Germany, I think they learned the lessons of 1918 and the lessons of Versailles. And uh, the German system wasn't uh, reconstituted. It was left very weak and uh, there wasn't external control. Uh, over Germany in this in this sense. No, I think uh, you're right in uh, voicing these concerns, but I think uh, 1945 provides a more favorable template for handling the issue of Russia. But then once again, don't get me wrong, I totally see the, at this point, 
the unfeasibility of this external control of Russia and, you know, then what? Occupying, like moving into Moscow, occupying Moscow, having the administrations in Russia. It's almost unthinkable. But I think we are in the area of the unthinkable already. Uh, once again, let's imagine we are in 1941 now. Who would have thought of, you know, of Stalin allying with Churchill and Roosevelt and, you know, the Allied powers moving into Germany? And, uh, you know, we are in the realm of the play of history. We don't know what the world would like in two years, in three years from now. I cannot, you ask me, I cannot imagine the world in 2025, sitting here in 2023. So I think it's useful to be entertaining even the most unthinkable scenarios. Which I, which I charted out here. So, um, and uh, once again, uh, the template of World War II and the resolution of World War II, let's hope without the 80 million people killed in the process, would be a uh, very welcome scenario. Uh, Clemena, please read the uh, online. Uh, well, while we're still talking about your scenario, Sergei, I'd like to combine two questions that relate to your last scenario about the reconstitution of uh, Russia. So uh, there's Carola Schneider who says, Dear Sergei, why do you think that the third scenario, reconstitution of Russia, is the most likely? To me, it seems the most unlikely. Or did I get you wrong? And then I'd like to combine that with a question by Clemens Zacharski uh, from the Kronen Zeitung. He says that he has a question again on the third scenario. How much time will be needed to complete it? Because I see a huge potential on, on revanchism here, something that was mentioned if uh, done too quickly. So these are two questions that mm -hmm. uh, I think you can answer together. And there's a very short question by Elizabeth that said, who asks, how can Russia be defeated without an all-out war? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, the first, uh, well, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, um, what's the name of the lady who asked the first question? Uh, Ka uh, Carola Schneider. Carola, Carola, Carola. Yeah, she, she got me wrong. It's uh, the most unlikely scenario, and I stressed it several occasions. It's the most uh, desired scenario. It's the absolutely optimistic scenario, which I'm lining, outlining here. But of course, uh, its likelihood is the smallest as of 2023, as of May 2023. Uh, now, how much time this will take? Once again, I don't know. As I say, we cannot really think about what lies two years ahead, three years ahead, probably the entire of the 21st century. It will take until year 2100. How much time did it take to reconstitute Germany? Can we say that Germany in the 50s was you know, completely at peace with its own past in the 60s? No, we had the historical strike in the 80s. We had you know, Nolte and Habermas arguing, and you know, we had two, three generations of Germans before the country occupied by allies, re-educated, re-established, reconstituted. You know, it took almost 70 years for Germany finally to, you know, to get rid of the legacy of fascism. So I think in Russia's case, it could be even longer. It may, lead, may be, and we're talking not about the 20 years of Putinism. We're talking about undoing the entire imperial legacy. What I didn't touch about is, you know, the previous Russian atrocities, the atrocities of Chechnya. Ukraine is no different from Chechnya, what Russia was doing there in the two wars of Chechnya. The genocide which was taking place there, the ethnic cleansing, Syria. We're talking now about Mariupol, but what about Aleppo? which was destroyed by the same missiles, by the same people, by the same Suravikin, who was just, you know, the tens of thousands of uh, Syrian civilian lives lost uh, through Russia's military crimes. Afghanistan, a million Afghanis killed. Some say even two million. A million people killed in 10 years. Who remembers about this now? Who will make answer answerable? And the, the same war generals who are now leading the war in Ukraine who killed those million Afghan civilians between 1978 and 1979 and 1989. So, so you know, there's a problem, uh, there's a process of uh, uh, Russia's uh, guilt and responsibility in dealing with this guilt uh, for which goes back uh, for at least uh, 100 years, several hundred years. So um, it really might take a longer, longer period. 
of uh, this reconstitution of Russia. As for the Russian military defeat, yes, it is quite imaginable. <sighs> Russia, military nuclear superpower, suffered a defeat in uh, Afghanistan. As easy as that. She just uh, withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, Russia suffered a defeat in Crimean War. Russia sorry, in 1854-55. Russia suffered a defeat in the Russo-Japanese War in the Far East. Russia, you can say, suffered a defeat in Chechnya. Russia was defeated in Chechnya. The peace is done on Chechen terms. So uh, it's very easy to imagine a military defeat of Russia without the world collapsing in nuclear flames. So yes, Russia can be defeated, and Ukraine is working towards this. Thank you. Uh, we shall collect three questions. Uh, first here, then here, then there, and then fourth in the back. My name is Leo Gabriel from the Institute of Intercultural Research. I have two questions. One to you as an historian, uh, trying to get the facts and the others about political analysis. Uh, how sure, you have certainly made the research, uh, was it that there was a deal between Reagan and Gorbachev uh, with the dismantling of the Varsovia Pact at the same time as NATO? Uh, because that seems to me very relevant in the analysis. Uh, the uh, expansion to the east of NATO also. Uh, and the second question is, uh, it might be, as you say, that the people are not a, a real subject, uh, but uh, there are other uh, currents. If we see it nowadays, the declarations of Prigozhin or of uh, um, in Chechnya, uh, mm -hmm. Kadyrov. Kadyrov. Uh, on the one side, and on the other side, I've heard that. Uh, uh, certain parts of the oligarchy are getting very nervous as long as more than the voice uh, because they are losing money. Uh, what do you say about that? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Then go ahead. Go ahead then uh, there, three, yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Schubert from the Austrian Daily The Standard. Um, if you say that for Putin this is already World War three, which I think, unfortunately, you are perfectly right, but he must have some um, expectations uh, concerning the future role of the U.S. So what do you think is his strategy, uh, pardon, his strategy towards uh, Washington, mm -hmm. uh, also in terms of the upcoming presidential elections next year? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank you so Thanks. much. One more. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Robert Wiesner. I'm just wondering... Uh, why you mainly refer to, uh, uh, why you refer to external powers, other other states, other powers, uh, to bring about change? Uh, aren't there internal forces uh, you could rely on? And uh, also referring to Brigoshin, how do you interpret interpret uh, the mm -hmm. fact that that guys like him can criticize openly the the government and and and, and the Kremlin? Uh, whereas other people are just uh, arrested for just holding an empty, uh, an empty uh, um, uh, um, signboard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Here we go. And then we shall have online. And then, uh, uh, sorry, there are a lot of questions. May, may now. I should... just answer these? Yes, and of, then course, take of the course. The last ones. Okay. Well, thanks for your questions. Uh, on the on the history question, on the Reagan Gorbachev deal and the breakup of um, you know the the Warsaw Pact, uh, and. Um, from my understanding, from what, you know, we've been really coming back to these uh, issues of these negotiations of the late 80s, uh, because this is one of the main Russian arguments, that the West cheated on us, the West betrayed us, the West promised this and then delivered that, and that's a very popular line in Russia. I think it is rubbish. Uh, because there were no clear guarantees, there were no written guarantees on the non-expansion of NATO at the time. Indeed, it was unthinkable. The point is that the paradigm was very different at the time. And there was uh, about uh, a period of cooperation and thinking about cooperative security. So NATO wasn't seen as an arch enemy and as something that would you know, expand into the Russian sphere of influence. 
So uh, I think uh, that uh, the West did not violate any written obligations. And what's more, in the 90s, um, the thinking was more towards Russia becoming part of NATO. Russia, even Putin in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, he was talking about possible Russian NATO membership. And it was basically a bottom line in the 1990s that Russia should eventually become a member of the European Union, a member of NATO. Russia was given a privileged partnership with NATO, uh, a privileged status uh, with um, uh, de dealing uh, with North Atlantic Alliance. So uh, in this sense, uh, I would say this whole talk of the West violating the obli its obligations and thus provoking Russia to become imperialist and aggressive, it's, it's a Russian invention. It's a Russian invention saying that we are a betrayed and insulted nation. Uh, so um, I wouldn't say that there is sort of a Versailles situation of the allies imposing an unjust peace on Russia. Russia was just submitting its own privileges, as Soviet Union and territory in exchange for peace with the West. Also being in a very dire economic circumstances. Gorbachev achieved the maximum what he could out of this situation. But then the situation was changing and the West was acting out of its interest. And I don't take this theory that uh, the West provoked Russia to become belligerent. Uh, I will combine two questions on political actors in Russia. And of course, well, yeah, everyone is asking about Prigozhin and Kadyrov, which shows their media efficiency. That, you know, these guys uh, make people in Vienna asking about if they are going to do something. I would say no. They are like really the scarecrows for the Russian oligarchs, for the Russian elite, and for the West, saying that Putin displays them that, look, we have these terrible guys uh, like Prigozhin and Kadyrov, and that's only me, Putin, who keeps them in check, who keeps them in control. Uh, now, they, of course, they're giving more leeway because Russia is not, has, does not have a system of institutions. It has personal relationships or personal loyalties between certain actors and Putin. It looks like more is a bit like a Byzantine court. Uh, the closer circle of people that and some have a more uh, leeway in dealing with Putin, some have less leeway. So uh, I wouldn't say that they have a political clout. Uh, they don't even have a sufficient military resource uh, reserve and they don't have like a political subjectivity. They don't have a project for the future of Russia. What do you think like, you know, Kadyrov taking over power in Russia? Uh, I don't really believe it. So uh, no, I think the, uh, the future lies in the hands of some other people. We don't know them yet. They could be second, third tier. Uh, there is lots of uh, resentment and uh, disagreement in uh, the lower rank military who feel that they are betrayed by the high commanders and uh, who want revenge. So we may see some kind of a military, not a military coup, but a, a military descent. Um, when Putin goes, and he will go eventually, I think there's a whole broad range of options. And I don't really have a ready scenario. Uh, and most likely this will not be a peaceful transition of power like in 1953 after the death of Stalin because it was a much more institutionalized system of collective decision making of Politburo and Stalin's closest allies. So we will have a very hectic and chaotic period. And um, uh, I think actors other than Prigozhin and uh, Kadyrov uh, will come up. And on the uh, US role, um, uh, and Trump. Well, Putin ideally sees the division of the world into spheres of influence. Uh, so Russia and the United States are the two biggest, uh, and China are the two biggest superpowers. U.S. is the reference point. U.S. is really, like Russia wants to be measured by, the, by America. America is the only really addressee of Russian politics. So Russian politics is measured by the White House. Whatever Russia does and says and uh, so it doesn't act, it wants an approval or disapproval from the White House. It wants to be noticed from the White House. It's really look, very childish and infantile in this. Where are the big guys who want to be noticed by the other big guys. So, uh, uh, so Russia wants a uh, sort of a division of the spheres of influence with the United States. And secondly, I think Putin is still very hopeful on the comeback of Trump into the White House in 2024, or the Republicans. Uh, that uh, the balance, uh, rather shaky balance in support of Ukraine will shift and uh, the U.S. will tire off supporting Ukraine and the elections will drive the United States towards this. So once again, Putin, you know, now he is uh, 
uh, counting on time. So as his blitzkrieg had failed, and then it had failed the second time with the so-called Russian offensive in Kherson and last, last fall. So now from 2023 on, uh, Russia's strategy is time. Is protracted warfare, trench warfare, and holding on as soon as, as long as possible and waiting for the West to weaken and uh, to start to crumble. And external versus internal powers uh, influences in Russia. So far, I don't see any internal forces inside the country able to change, transform, or um, uh, to revolutionize the country. Uh, and looking at the history of social and political change in Russia, I would say that in all cases, change came from outside. Russia is a place, as I said, it's very a place of entropy. It doesn't have enough political subjectivity, enough power, enough force to remake itself from within. It was always transformed by external events, a defeat in, uh, a defeat in the war, external ideology, external powers, external economic assistances in Russia's industrialization, and so on. And then there were internal actors at play, but I mean, they were, the initial push was coming always from the outside. So if you ask me, Russia is not able to start a revolution from within. Russia is not able to transform itself from within. It needs an external force. And paradoxically, the external force these days are Ukrainians. So a Ukrainian, a defeat of Russia from Ukraine may start the process of transformation from the, of this country. But we still have to make this defeat happen. Thank you. Uh, we still ha uh, we shall extend a couple of minutes. Uh, I will ask Lemena to uh, yes. ask the question ah. online and then uh, in the back uh, in the room. I just want to make one comment. You said that uh, uh, Moscow looks at the reactions of Washington. I have to say that my colleagues, journalists, read the New York Times, uh, Russian journalists, read New York Times uh, uh, first and almost the only, <laughs> that, that's the reference. So it's, uh, it applies for journalists as well. <laughs> Go ahead, Clemena. Yes. Uh, well, I'd like to read a question by a PhD student, but before that, can I make a remark? Because I think that our colleague here who asked the question about NATO, if I understand correctly, you were referring not to a written agreement, because I think it is very widely known that there is no written agreement. I think what he referred to was to repeated official assurances in conversations among political leaders. And this is where the, the sort of often repeated by Western, some Western scholars Russian, uh, Russians as well, but also in the West, this often repeated phrase, not one inch to the east, comes from these conversations that actually quite well documented, I think they are in the uh, archives of the University of George Washington, and this was discussed in the 90s, famously by George Kennan and so on. So I think that this was what you were actually... Uh, yes. Excuse me, we need a microphone. Well, Oliver, okay. Oliver Stone is a rather dubious authority. Yes, yes, with respect yes. To Putin. But George yes. Kennan is yeah. not, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, that was just a small remark, but I'd like to read the question by uh, Margarita Hartanovich, who is a PhD student in journalism. And uh, this is what she says Regarding the positive post war scenarios, what do you see? as enablers of it. Will current Russian opposition play any role in it? I think it's a question that was already asked. Navalny, Yashin, the true Russia forum, and so on. What about those that immigrated, like yourself, Sergei? Uh, can it be influenced by the West? Or where will the change of all things come from? Thank you so much. And the last question, uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Gunther, please. And please introduce yourself. My name is Günther Fellinger. I'm from the Austrian Committee for NATO Enlargement for Austria and Ukraine. I'm also a member of the Free Nations Forum of Russia. Professor, my question is like this. Yeah. I was in Washington last week at the Free Nations Forum of Russia. There's legitimate independence movements of Chechenia, of Karelia, of Boratia, of also Saka and of Ingushetia, of also Tatarstan. Please, the question. We are, yeah. uh, we are Why out do of you time. dismiss it so much uh, as a fantasy? This is a bit unfair against these people who legitimately want to be free. 
Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Uh, there was no question, I see. Okay, so yeah. let's just... No, no, but I can, I, can, I can tackle this. Uh, I mean, you're t totally right, and I'm also following these developments, and I have uh, many colleagues uh, in this fora of free nations, and not Chechenia, but of course, Ichkeria, uh, it has to be called. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, and if you see it, my life is two points, uh, uh, penultimate, decolonization, demoscovization, um, Russia has to be decolonized. And, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, this, uh, the independence of uh, Ingria, the independence of you know, the small nations, there is really a feasible option. So I'm looking at a Russia which is uh, like a confederation, uh, Russia of um, a multicultural Russia. Once again, once we remove uh, uh, the system of Putinism, once we try to deconstruct uh, the system of imperial power inherited from the past 500 years, uh, once the power is hopefully moved away from Moscow, um, I believe there will be various forms of autonomy and independence for these various subjects in the Russian space. So I'm fully supportive of this case. I'm just, you know, trying to be realistic and saying that, you know, Russia will not become like Germany after 1648, like there are small principalities all over the place and, uh, you know, a hundred states in the place of Russia. Uh, as uh, to the question of the opposition, um, there are two layers, and watch, uh, I have just tremendous respect uh, and admiration uh, for the courage of the people, especially those who returned to Russia, clearly, uh, facing imprisonment. Alexei Navalny, uh, Alexei Karamurza, uh, Yashin, who stayed in Russia, Alexei Gorin, uh, all those who stay in Russia, and they are true politicians. In a country with no politics, they are the only ones representing Russian politics. Russian politics is not Putin, Russian politics is Navalny. Uh, this is uh, for sure. However, with all due respect, uh, I don't see, unfortunately, them playing a major role in the reconstitution of Russia. As well as I don't really uh, see, once again, I, I'm linked with many people who are doing the opposition for now. I uh, have I'm a good personal relationship with Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Uh, I can say so about, uh, you know, Kasparov, but, you know, I know about his activities and, um, and so on. I have full respect and I am following them, but as a political analyst and a forecaster, uh, I don't see them playing a major role in the reconstitution of a future Russia. It's a necessary job, it's a necessary work which is done there, uh, assembling the Russian opposition forces, uh, preserving the intellectual potential, developing the scenarios for a future Russia. But I think politics uh, will be decided on the ground, will be decided by other people. And uh, once again, it's too early to call. We have yet to slain the dragon. Russia has yet to be defeated militarily in Ukraine. And this may take another, well, not here, it may take another 10 years. We're in a vein to a very protracted story, very long history. I think we'll be staying with Putin, we'll be staying with this war for a long time to come. And uh, we have just to brace up and uh, once again, uh, bring back the perspective of 1945. I'm saying this on the 10th of May. 2023, on these days of remembrance. We have to remember 1945 and finish off the work of 1945, and only then we can bring about the future. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, <laughs> I uh, think that the future uh, topic that has uh, come up is the normalization of a war and what it will mean for different layers of the society in Russia and in Europe. Thank you very much for your thoughts. We shall have many more events to try to understand the current situation in Russia, in Europe, and the consequences of uh, this policy, because we have only spoken about one element. There are so many elements uh, to understand tr and try to understand. An applause for Sergei, thank and you. thank you all so much. Uh. Can I just say something that I'm sorry to all the online audience that sent really interesting questions that I've been looking at. There's no time to uh, answer them now, but I think that probably Sergei can take Yeah, I can probably them. forward them yes. to me. And this online, is it, will it be on, online? Uh, this uh, there will be, we will have a recording. A recording. We it will post be. it on uh, uh, the Con uh, Concordia YouTube channel. Okay, so w when uh, will you post it to how? We are live now. 
Right, but eventually, uh, so it, it's already online, so it's accessible, for instance, it can exactly. be posted. Yes, well, the, if there are questions in there, I will try to answer. So I can go to, like, YouTube and uh, answer uh, the questions on YouTube. Right, right, yes, and I could just enter them in the comments on YouTube because I guess there could be some comments so I can collect them and if it's on YouTube, so that's, that's fine. So uh, the sure. war will last uh, and uh, the question and answers will last and we shall have a lot yes. more events. An ongoing process. It will be an yes. ongoing process. Yes. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you.